Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's big, big, big show. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm really looking forward to this. There's some news here. Right. There's some big news, big time leadership, big time company, and they're making big time moves and investments when it comes to the fast growth world of cold storage. We're going to be talking with a big global supply chain leader in that regard. Now, Greg, uh, the cold storage industry in general is a fascinating one, right? It is. I mean, as if it wasn't big enough just with food and beverage and all of that before, um, which I'm really familiar with from my past, but uh, something happened a couple of years ago that really, really got folks uh, moving forward in, in terms of cold storage, right? I think there was a vaccine or something like that that people... <laughs> Well, it certainly led to uh, uh, quite a mission across the world led by yeah. the supply chain industry to, to push all of us firmly into the post-pandemic environment. We're excited about that. The noble mission we've been calling it around here. So today, right. as Greg and I are chatting about, we're going to be we're going to be talking specifically uh, with a leader from a company that has really doubled down uh, on the cold storage space. So with no further ado, Greg White, let's welcome in our featured guest. Jim Sapinero, President of Life Sciences and Healthcare at DHL Supply Chain North America. Hey, hey, hey Jim, how you doing? Hey, welcome aboard, good. Jim. How are you all? We good, are good. doing wonderful. After a, a, you know, after all of our technologists came out and helped us out to make this connection, I think we're doing a lot better, and we're a lot closer to the big story, the big news y'all are making at DHL. Right. So on that note, before we get to that, though, Jim, a little birdie told us uh, that you grew up in one of our favorite cities of Cleveland. So tell us about what it was like growing up in Cleveland and, and uh, give us some aspects of your upbringing. Yeah, no, C Cleveland was a blast. I lived uh, in the northeast part of uh, Cleveland in Menor, right on the lake and uh, grew up uh, like most kids. I wish they would today fishing and building forts and taking wood from the new builds and building forts, which we thought was okay at the time, but uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> we all built forts and I, I don't know about y'all. We would, all, we'd build forts and we'd have dirt bomb wars, right? We throw yeah. dirt bombs oh, yeah. at each other, had a blast. Oh, we ever survived kind of those. You're right. <laughs> I, look, uh, we had forts with 14 rooms and you couldn't catch me crawling through something like that today, but we did back then. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, I'm okay. with you. It's amazing. We didn't get bit by snakes, but um, what yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? What else was uniquely? Uh, I think you you told us pre-show, uh, Greg. I think uh, Jim told us that he is uh, as Cleveland as it gets. I think was the phrase yeah, he used. Right. So what else was unique about growing up in Cleveland? I think you know. I think being on the lake was a lot of fun, right? We we went to we had a swimming pool right on the lake, and we went to the beach and we swam there. So that was really a lot of fun. It's a huge sports town, obviously, and, uh, you know, I'm a diehard and uh, live and die and uh, support all the teams and um, still waiting for some some big football wins. But uh, so it's been a, it's been a while and, uh, you know, always anxious for the next season and optimistic. So I'm a big Browns fan. Well, you know, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as Buckeye. You guys had Greg. a great start. The Browns did this season. I really think it was mostly injuries that were your issue. So yeah, I, hope, I, hope I have so, a good Greg. friend who's a Browns fan, and uh, we watched the first game together. So uh, yeah. you started having you guys go down in that very game, and it yeah. just did not help the season. We, no. you know, uh, Jim, we, we can't have we can't talk football in Cleveland without referencing those legendary teams in the '80s: the Bernie Kosars, uh, Kevin Mack, Michael Dean Perry. Because I'm we're big Clemson uh, fans around here. Uh, Reggie, is it was it Reggie Langerhorn, Langerhands yeah. maybe? Langerhorn, yeah. 
And then the tight end, I can't remember his name, but he is now Hall of Famer, and he's in, I think, NFL leadership. Um, Ozzie yeah, Newsome, some, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. All right. So now that we've established, we've established Jim's Cleveland credentials, Greg, I guess we've got to get into kind of the story of the day, right? I suppose we have to talk a little business here. So, yeah, I mean, Jim, you know, obviously you're in charge of life science and healthcare at DHL. And um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about how you you all uh, approach the market in your in your business. Absolutely. So I just took over uh, January one, uh, the president's role, but I've been with DHL for 11 years and I headed up operations for the same life science and healthcare sector for DHL supply chain. So I've been part of this growth and, and having a lot of fun uh, watching it grow and, and, and now taking the helm during this uh, crazy pandemic labor shortage you know supply chain crisis time it's been a it's been a lot of fun it's a challenge but it's been a lot of fun um dhl life science and healthcare sector is the largest 3pl in in the space by far we've got 35 sites uh, with over serving over 50 global customers and um with a variety of services, uh, obviously the core is warehousing, but secondary packaging, um, reverse logistics, postponement, um, and we also have transportation offerings, managed trans, inbound to manufacturing, and at the end, end of the day, it's a uh, it, we have, we offer end to end services for our for our clients. You know, I um, DHL is an enormous organization. I don't think people at least people in the States recognize just how big it is. But uh, I was doing business in Singapore with uh, someone in your organization. And I mentioned a prominent U.S. carrier and said, so how do you how do you see them in terms of competition competition? And they said, oh, we don't see them as competition. We're much bigger than they are. And we're in many, many more countries. And I, I mean, that they said it so matter of factly, right? It was not a brag at all. It was just so matter of factly that I had to dig into you guys and just see just how big you are. So can you share a little bit about that scale? Yeah, sure. So we are the largest logistics company in the world serving 222 countries. And we're the largest next day uh, service company in the world when it comes to express and transportation. I think folks think about when DHL came in here 15, 20 years ago, and that express business didn't work in the U.S., but globally, we're by far the biggest. I think the big secret that we're talking about today, uh, Greg and Scott, is DHL supply chain. DHL supply chain services uh, almost 500 sites now in North America, 500 sites, almost 150 million square feet we service. And then, you know, the life science uh, and healthcare sector is just one of many, right? We've got automotive, technology, Chem energy, um, uh, retail, consumer, and e-commerce. So, and if you go to Gardner and look at the top fifteen players in any of those, that's our portfolio for every one of those sectors. So we've, we've we're a pretty well kept secret, but folks don't think of us understanding that we've got forty thousand uh, employees with DHL supply chain right here um, in the U.S. and North America, and including Canada. Wow. Yeah, and I can tell you that having worked in countries around the world, DHL is the name that comes first to mind. I mean, that that honestly, as a as a young person in logistics early in my days, that was really shocking to me. But it's a it's a big deal, and, and it's the yeah, biggest deal outside of the states, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm yeah, curious. Europe, you, you see it everywhere. Yeah. Sorry, Greg. Yeah, Europe, uh, the Far East, a Africa, everywhere. Yeah, really. Um, right. And you know, I'm curious about the investment you've made. Obviously, you know, we were joking. We talked about the vaccine and and everything that went along with that. And and we've seen a huge investment in um, in uh, frozen and refrigerated and and uh, all of that in terms of supporting life sciences and the healthcare industry and vaccines in particular. Uh, so tell us, you guys just made a big investment. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, you know, as we mentioned, and we put a press release out there that we just invested 400 million euros uh, into the life science and healthcare space in North America. We grew our footprint over 27 percent 
and um, they're all pharmaceutical and medical device temp controlled and licensed facilities. Uh, that's going to result in uh, six new buildings and add an, uh, that, uh, again, results in another 3 million square feet that we're adding to, to our footprint. So we're, we're wow. pretty excited about that. Wow. And I think two of the, two of the uh, six new sites are going to be in the Atlanta area, uh, Jim, if I read that right. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Atlanta, Memphis, the, our Northeast campus is exploding. Um, and, and that's another big thing that's important to know about uh, DHL and life science and healthcare supply chain is we really separate ourselves and, and Greg, to your point, matter of factly from, from the rest of the competition because we have campuses and campuses are huge today. I mean, they've been really important in the past, with, with, but today with labor shortages and all the challenges that folks have to have a campus and be able to labor share like during the during the pandemic, uh, our Zimmer Biomet site, our dent supply site, they weren't able to do elective surgeries, right? We were able to place all those people in sites that were going through the roof, where right? you know, like mm. Bear and and J and J Healthcare, all all these companies were really really busy, and so uh, you know that that means a lot to our clients, right? You you know, not any other competitor can boast to that. And if they do, mm -hmm. it's like one building where, you know, you can go to the Northeast and we've got like 50 billion buildings in a 50 mile radius. It's pretty powerful. And so scale does matter. And, you know, a lot of times bigger is better, but I've never worked with a nicer group of people. So we're just we're just like you all, you know, at the end of the day. And I think that that makes a difference. Right. Agreed. Except Jim, Greg's not real nice. He's not a nice guy. So well, <laughs> he's a handsome dude. You know, he's a pretty good looking guy. I'll give him that. And, he, and, I agree. and he's got a Browns fan. He's got a Browns friend. So, you know, you can't yeah, that's right. Thank so, you. Uh, Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> so, and and Jim, I don't see German nearly as well as most DHL -ers <laughs> do, I'm sure. Uh, exciting times, uh, and congrats on the relatively new, uh, leadership role. I think I heard you say you started in early January of this year. Um, so from what I understand about cold storage, uh, you've got overseas markets that where uh, market share is growing. And I think U S pharmaceutical companies are really having to embrace cold storage to protect their products as they, as they take advantage of those, uh, in, in a good way of those business opportunities. In fact, um, as you look at uh, the overall gold, uh, cold storage market, uh, I think in, in Supply Chain Dive, where you were quoted in a recent story related to your press release, Biopharma Cold Chain Sourcebook says that global cold chain spending is, is expected to grow some 24% between 2020 and 2024, expecting about right. 2024 to reach $21.3 billion. Holy cow. Exactly. Um, yeah. So with those big, big numbers, and I love how you said that scale matters. It's scale certainly matters. Um, yeah. When it comes to the cold storage industry, um, I, I want to ask you what might surprise some of our listeners, but feel free to comment on some of those big numbers before you even share some of the things that might surprise our folks. Yeah. So, the, you know, it's no surprise that there's that growth, right? I mean, that little thing called the pandemic, um, obviously those are cold chain products. And uh, we participated as a global company in a major way. Uh, in the U.S., our managed transportation for Pfizer delivered uh, many, many doses of, of the Pfizer vaccine that we're pretty excited about. You know, when they talk about cold chain storage, we're, we're different in that we're, we're not a storage, right? We're a life science and healthcare company, right? We're fully licensed. And we've got compliance and regulatory and standards that are, are, are industry leading, right? So you go into any of our buildings, you'll see the same things, the same processes, and that means a lot to a customer. That allows us to move our people around without missing a beat. But when it comes to cold chain, to your point, um, we've invested 80, 000, in our uh, 80,000 square feet in one of our Northeast facilities because we saw this coming. Because even before the pandemic, You've got individualized medicines that you guys probably heard of that are coming out, right? That may only have some 60,000 patients in the U.S. Um, you've got biosimilars that are huge, right? Of course, oncology has always been a big player in cold chain. And so 
we participate in all those spaces. We've done vaccines for years for companies like GSK. And um, we, uh, we we think one we're one of the leaders, right? But uh, yeah. um, there's, there's no doubt it's going to continue to grow. Uh, that's fascinating. I think I used cold storage instead of cold chain earlier. So my apologies. I didn't want to confuse yeah, anyone. Yeah. Cold chain, yeah. cold chain. Um, okay. So Jim, yeah. <laughs> Out of all of that, um, what might operating in the cold chain industry, what might surprise some of the folks, uh, any unique aspects about that? I think I, I think just in, in life sciences overall, uh, in a life science and healthcare company for DHL, um, safety comes first. I think that's really important. I think people um, are coming out and working in sites and they want to know that they're going to be taken care of. And quality and compliance are the other minimum requirements, right? And then after that, um, it's we have a culture of respect and results, and I think that makes a huge difference with our employees and working in that environment. There's uh, standard operating procedures, not to bore you, but we, you know we make sure they've got gloves and they're and they've got good DHL coats, and we take care of them and uh, we celebrate their success. But you know. I wanted to talk for a second about innovation and our accelerated digitalization agenda. But before I get there, at the end of the day, with all the stuff going on with technology, it's still a people business, right? They're the secret right. sauce. But I will Absolutely. tell you that we're we're leading the way with technology, with, with our accelerated published accelerated digitalization agenda. And again, I'll come back, Greg and Scott, to the fact that size does matter. So we can work with these tiny little companies that have these really neat inventions, but have no scale to manufacture and have, and we become this big testing ground, right? We, we you know, 500 sites, you've got a lot of buildings you can test. I'll give you a great example. Locust Bots, a very, it was a small company out of Boston. Seven years ago, we started with them at Zimmer Biomet. We now deploy over 1,600 Locust Bots, and we needed 15,000 people for the end of season, right? Seasonality in our businesses, not just not life sciences per se, but we were able to use only hire 12,000 people because of our, our use of technology. And then we've helped these players mature these technologies like uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles, right? Autonomous operated vehicles. Really quick, Greg, I wanna, I wanna get your commentary on what you just heard Jim say, uh, and also wanna back up to one of your favorite words that we talk about here, provenance, because that, he, he addressed that on the front end of his answer. But uh, sticking with the last part there, I love how, um, how his view on people, because it, 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 we're kindred spirits there. People make global supply chain happen. And I love his last point there about how all this massive investment in technology has created not just a bunch of jobs, but a bunch of jobs working with robotics and automation, which should give all of those workers some great experience that they can leverage up in the market. But Greg, speak to that a bit. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a couple of things that, uh, in addition to that, that stood out to me. One, yes, obviously, uh, because people are not breaking down the doors to get into some of these supply chain roles. I think robotics and aut autonomous and automation are inevitable. And we've talked a lot about that on various shows. But um, that we that they were able to, in a time when when labor was exceedingly short, provide capability for companies that otherwise would have run short, that's incredible. The other thing that jumps out at me that I think is particularly interesting is the ability for someone who is an innovation company, whose focus is you know, building the next medicine or building the next device or, or you know, their job is life saving, for them to be able to focus solely on that and then to have a backbone like what DHL offers to say, OK, we're ready to try and bring this to market. We're ready to you know, to scale this, as, as Jim said, out to the world. Look, that is the direction. As you know, that is what I think the future of supply chain ought to be is companies are good at making or merchandising or selling stuff. They're lousy for the most part at logistics and to have an organization that is so focused to take someone, take a company and allow them to do what they are really, really best at and then deploy at scale with such rapidity and with such a complete offering, compliant and 
um, you know, actually, as as Jim, you said, an actual healthcare company. Right. That's incredible. And think about the pace that that adds and the, the surety that that adds to the healthcare supply chain when we can go, ah, Eureka, we found the cure for the common cold, <laughs> if only. Um, <laughs> and now we can now we can get it out to the market. And all we got to do is make a phone call and Jim and his team make it happen. So love that. Obviously, uh, mostly we're simplifying and, it, Jim. And, but, and, and Greg, if I may, to your point, folks love working with technology. You know, they love it. You know, we do uh, vision pick with the smart glasses, and they enjoy that so much. And at first, everybody was a little skeptical. They love. They fight for it. They fight for those jobs where they get to use technology, and it's kind of cool. And it does expand that. their their expertise. We now have technicians that only work with the autonomous uh, operated vehicles. And we have videos and the pride that these guys have that they, they used to run the forklift truck. Now they're working with this technology and, it, and they're just kind of beaming about it. And it's created new roles. And um, it's neat to see. Love that. Jim, um, do they give them names? They give these autonomous devices. Oh yeah, absolutely. Names. Yeah, yeah. I had a, I had a, I had a locust spot in the early days named after me. I won't tell you what they call it, but. <laughs> well, uh, I bet we, I bet you'll have a lot of fun with those names. Uh, yeah, we'll have to interview the bot that's named Ric Flair, maybe a, in a later episode. Yeah. yeah there you uh, go. But, but also maybe uh, out of those hundreds, if not thousands, of bots you are using. Who knows? Maybe the Browns, the Cleveland Browns, could borrow a few and improve, make enhancements to their offensive or defensive lines. Jim, we're not going to need them, Scott. We're we're ready. <laughs> I think Greg 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 hit it on the head. They've got some injuries. They're going to heal up. They're going to make some nice offseason acquisitions. They've got a good front office. Going to make some great draft picks that are going to make a contribution, and uh, we're going to go for it all next Jim. year. Greg, I don't know if you heard that, but I think Jim's got a second career as maybe a, a PR person for a sports team or something. I love that rosy picture he just painted. Um, well, I feel right. like I feel like a, you know an a advocate for the Browns, Chiefs fan. So we shared a coach, the great Marty Schottenheimer. We have had yep. much the same history, decades between yep. between championships. Um, yep. We opened the God season together. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. there, there is a lot of empathy between Browns and Chiefs fans and um, we're pulling for them right up until they play us. That's right. Uh, but, but we should have been two I, years I ago. I'm not going to talk week, about yeah. the, the sparing penalty or any of that, Greg. Two years ago, we would have been in the championship game. I'm not going to go there because that would just be, you know, let's, we're, we're getting along great. So let's just leave it at that. <laughs> you you know, with my you know, with my friends that I've already heard a lot about that. You might oh, have, yes. yeah, yeah. I, I'm letting it go personally. I'm good with it. <laughs> Thanks. You're a good, good man, Jim. It, there's a phrase that says "let go or be dragged," so it's good to let yeah, let right. that stuff go there, Jim and Greg. Right. Um, so a minute ago, Greg mentioned the word Eureka. Right, there's Eureka moments. Uh, as clearly with all the innovation going on at DHL, the team sounds like you're having in, uh, Eureka moments very regularly. Uh, with rapidity, I think is a, is a phrase, uh, a word that Greg used okay. momentarily. I have to look that up. Um, anyway, so Jim, Eureka moments. These last couple of years, man, they've yeah. been tough, right? The industry, uh, yeah. thankfully, global supply chain is really, despite you know warts and all, it's it's been amazing to see it keep moving, keep moving, yeah, keep I moving think, forward. I think what we've seen uh, when it comes to kind of aha moments, if you will, uh, Scott and Greg, is the fact that at DHL supply chain and in all of our sectors, but in our life science and healthcare sector, you know, those companies, pharma, medical device, and so on, they've been some of the last ones to outsource, right? They've held on to that. And they're, uh, I think Greg made the point earlier, they're figuring out that that's not their core competency. We live, eat, and sleep, and drink it, right? And we've got scale and we're committed to people and talent. And so we're seeing more folks. For, uh, become what we call first-time outsourcers, right? So that's that's one. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. I also think that what we've gone through with the pandemic has has folks looking in the United States and North America at their manufacturing space and saying we shouldn't be storing any product here, right? We've got to increase our manufacturing capabilities, and that's great for us. And we stand ready to serve all the industries with that. And then finally, I would say that. 
when people look to automation, like uh, automated storage and retrieval units, you know, like, like a company like Auto Store that we use a lot, um, they're not always looking for a return on investment like they used to because they know if that if that big, huge uh, building, if you will, inside our building full of robots can take up to 16 to 30 people away, that's a big deal because they know mm -hmm. probably a labor shortage is here to stay. So it was always like, oh, it's too expensive. You know, we can't pay for that. And the other thing that's happening is customers are not treating this like a commodity as they never should have in the first place, right? So we're seeing more 10-year agreements than we ever have. And that's mm. part of it is because when you invest in that kind of technology, which is expensive, you, you need to stay with that player. But, you know, in our case, we've got many 30 and 40 year clients. And, and I think that says a lot with big names that, you know, you'd be proud to put on the screen. Mm. OK, so, Greg, I want to get your take on, on a lot of what Jim just wrapped there as we head down the home stretch, uh, talking with Jim Sapanero with DHL Supply Chain North America. Greg, what did you hear there? Oh, uh, I mean, I think those are those are four eureka moments and um, all of them, I think, really impactful. And some we've seen reflected, not all, but but all of those, I think, speak to how supply chain has changed and frankly why it has changed to Jim's point these incoming generations they don't want to do the the what is it we call it the 3Ds dark dirty and dangerous that people perceive a lot of supply chain jobs as being and we already had a 2 million person shortage of supply chain talent even before the pandemic started and it's only gotten worse as volumes have grown as uh, you know as Jim as you said that as companies have leaned more and more on on third parties to to run their logistics operations, or frankly, even right. if they run them internally. Um, so recognizing that and recognizing that the world has changed probably for good from uh, a, a labor standpoint, which he also exemplified by saying, you know, they're they're engaging people to work with technology, which is what Gen Z and millennials want to do. They want to work with technology. We don't right. have to apologize for technology taking anyone's job anymore because the jobs that technology is taking, no one literally in many cases wants. Yeah. So Jim, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. And I'm going to share one other uh, aspect of, of uh, one of your Eureka moments. No, I, 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 I think your comments are spot on, right? Uh, folks want to be a part of change. They want to be a part of growth. And they want to be a part of a of a company that cares for them, not just have a you know what DDD job or blue collar job. We don't think about that. I mean, you know, warehousing and distribution is one of the last bastions that you can start in a forklift truck or picking product and run that building. We still have people that do that. That's pretty amazing. We'll put them through college, by the way. But we have people in major leadership roles that work their way up from the floor, you know, including our CEO which is pretty darn cool. And, and, and so when you talk to people about a career, I think it makes a big difference. And then, you know, we kind of, we don't take a front to the 3PL, but we've really become an extension of the manufacturers, right? We're, we're really part of their supply chain in a big way. And we're, and we're, we're busting through into their planning, you know, into their manufacturing to say, if you let us, you know, be a part of that, then, you know, we can streamline the cost of supply chain and, and really help you. And they're starting to take us up on that. I love that. Uh, and then one other thing you touched mm -hmm. on was it was these longstanding partnerships, right? You all, you, I think you mentioned 30 and 40 years. And I, I think, you know, I bet there's been some rough days in those 30 or 40 days, but you know what, that's, that's where the partnership begins, right? When, when, <laughs> when they bring their problems and you work through it, right? So, uh, you know, if anything's taught us, what's that phrase you said, you said, Greg, um, you can't make friends in the middle of a, a what, how do you say it, Greg? Well, I think, I, I think we, we co-opted that from somebody early in the pandemic. It's too late to make friends now, right? Mm. If you've treated your vendors, your suppliers, your business partners horribly, then once crisis hits, it's too late to make friends. Mm. And um, truthfully, those relationships are, as you said, Scott, they're strengthened through adversity. Right. I've seen That's it right. over and over and over again. So, Jim, we differently, Greg, I always tell my people that a crisis is, a, is an opportunity to get closer to your customer. 
right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you come in there hat in hand if it's on your side or, you know, you're there to help them if it's on their side, but there's no finger pointing. It's, It's get joined at the shoulders and let's get this thing figured out. Once we get through that crisis, then let's do the lessons learned and make sure it doesn't happen again. Right. Mm. And, uh, you know, because one thing we say in life science and healthcare at DHL is zero defects. Right. We're not interested in KPIs that say ninety nine point eight or whatever they are. We're interested in zero defects, 100 percent. And that's our goal every day. And that starts at the, at the you know, at the picker all the way up to me. So I'm, I'm not that. doing as well as that. But I'm, I'm <laughs> well, so Greg, it's, I'll tell it's you, it's a lot of saving just, industry. I mean, you have to be precise, right? Yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah, so Jim strikes me as a great individual to work for. So, uh, I'd love to maybe down the road we hear from your team members, and I bet there's some great stories and a book or two to be published in those long, you know, decades long relationships. We'll save that for another time, too. Um, Jim, yeah. I really appreciate you taking time out. Uh, and spending some uh, uh, some time with us here at Supply Chain Now on this big news uh, related to Coal Chain. How can folks connect with you and uh, DHL Supply Chain North America to learn more? Yeah, great. Thanks for asking that question, Scott. We're we're in the podcast business too. We've got DHL All Business No Boundaries, and so if you go to dhl.com backslash All Business No Boundaries, you can check us out. And, and and you can get a lot of information if you just go to dhl.com. So we're uh, it's just we're front that easy. Center. Front yeah. center. I think you should interview us yeah. next, Jim. Let's turn about as <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, it is such a pleasure. We loved the the, the Cleveland talk. I love the, the Cleveland yeah. Browns talk. Uh, I love the um, I love your view. No finger pointing and standing shoulder to shoulder and making things happen. And I'll tell you, if if the last two years taught us anything, we know that we, we, we've got to have partners like that. Right. And then, uh, we learn from, you know, we learn from, uh, what takes place. Uh, so we'll be stronger next go around. So Jim, uh, well, thank you so much for your time yeah. here today. Sure. Enjoy talking to you, to you, Scott and to you, Greg, it's been a pleasure and hopefully we can uh, break bread one of these days. Let's that do sounds it. Good. Mark it. Appreciate We're it. writing All that right. down. We're writing that down, right. Jim. We're going to hold you to it. Okay. Look for it. Thanks, Jim. All right. Awesome. All right. We'll see you You bet. Jim Sapinero, president of Life Sciences and Healthcare at DHL Supply Chain North America. Big thanks, uh, Jim, for joining us. Greg, okay. man, uh, I think Jim really meant that. I think he he is willing to break bread with me and you and talk football and supply chain and other things, huh? Yeah, you meet somebody from the Midwest. It's, uh, Cleveland is a very blue collar city, kind of like Kansas City is. And that standing shoulder to shoulder and leaning in, that's a very real thing. And it's often it's it's by necessity. I mean, you know, the Midwest and, and a lot of those um, land grant state communities went through some tough times. And I think it just becomes a part of who you are. And it's interesting too uh, that that it's a part of of the DHL culture uh, as well. I mean, I had the opportunity to work with DHL uh, with a company in with their division, one of their divisions, uh, and a retailer in Singapore and around Southeast Asia. And um, you know, a lot of what they're talking about, they have been doing for years, making technology, not not just physical technology, and not just inside the four walls of the warehouse or transportation technology, but also the planning technology that Jim talked about. We were in conjunction with them offering planning technology to some of the biggest grocery retailers in Singapore and Hong Kong and and the rest of Southeast Asia. So it's uh, impressive how far ahead of the curve they've been and how relevant they have remained and how much more they can continue to invest. I mean, you just think at the scale that we know them now, just maybe even some people just from this conversation, you realize right. that they are way, way ahead of the curve for uh, compared to many of their competitors and to, and to many of the companies that they service. So it's, a, it's an impressive organization, as you'd expect from the German post office. Could anyone be more <laughs> precise than the German post office? Well, we so must what I'm gathering. 
<laughs> what I'm gathering is it, 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 their culture must be fueled by deeds, not words. Right. Uh, and you've Indeed. got firsthand experience working right. with them. That's wonderful. Um, okay. So we're going to keep our finger on the pulse of uh, the cold chain, this massive cold chain investment uh, that's going to uh, fuel uh, their growth and fuel the ability to serve globally in the months ahead. But big mm -hmm. thanks to Jim and the team over at DHL Supply Chain North America. All right. So, Greg, always a pleasure to have these conversations with you. We look forward to the next batch. We'll have Jim back on soon. Maybe we'll break bread and talk more football and amongst other things. Listeners, hopefully you enjoyed this episode as much as Greg and I did, right? A little bit of football, a little bit of supply chain, a little bit of noble mission, a little bit of uh, cold chain, you name it. Uh, folks, win. find us. Cleveland, lots of Cleveland. That's right. Uh, make sure you find more uh, Supply Chain Now, wherever you get your podcasts, for more conversations just like this. Check out DHL's podcast. That sounds like a good one. I think it's Front and Center was the name of it. But most importantly, most importantly, folks, hey, take a page out of Jim's book and challenging you to, to do good, to give forward, and to be the change that's needed. And with that said, we'll see you next time right back here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.